My name is Paul Nurse, I'm President of the Royal Society and I'm also Director of a new institute being put up in London, the Francis Crick Institute, which when we open in 2015 will have about 1,300 scientists working on uh, biology and my biomedical research problems. And we uh, were excited at, at being able to call this institute the Francis Crick Institute because um, certainly in my view um, he is the uh, greatest uh, British um, uh, biologist of the 20th century and he understood the importance of um, logic and information in understanding how living things work and that's going to be central also to what we're going to be doing in, um, in the Francis Crick Institute. He also recognised the importance of multidisciplinarity and that's something else we will also embrace. The Francis Crick Institute is, is, is quite novel. It's very large which allows us to cover many disciplines so it allows the multidisciplinary agenda to be more easily assimilated. We also have strong connections with three universities so that means we can get access to disciplines which are not normally found in biological and biomedical research institutes, disciplines um, involving the physical sciences, chemistry, physics, maths, computing, engineering. Um, often these are only present in very small amounts in an institute. By having close interactions with the universities, we can have access to many, many scientists in these disciplines. We will also be able to have access to clinical scientists, to human subject research, which of course is where eventually our discoveries will end up. So by covering both the physical science Sciences and also the clinical sciences, we hope to actually make the, the um, whole endeavour in the Crick Institute um, both more effective and also more relevant. Um, promoting a multidisciplinary approach, frankly, is quite difficult. Many people say they're doing it and it isn't actually that effective. So we're trying out experimentally, because I'm not quite sure what will work, different ways to try and promote that. For example, we'll have a different graduate program, graduate student program, which means that those that come from the physical sciences and clinical sciences will do a foundation year allowing them to get up to speed in biology and biomedicine so that they can take on research projects, bringing their skill set, bringing their training to these sorts of problems. We've invented uh, um, an internal granting mechanism, we're calling it um, uh, uh, satellite groups, whereby um, a, a researcher in the Crick Institute um, can collaborate with uh, a multidisciplinary researcher, one studying a different area in the universities and that will result in one, two or three researchers perhaps coming from the university to work in the Crick in a particular group or the reverse, one, two, three researchers or thereabouts going from a Crick researcher into the university so to promote that multidisciplinary approach. And the third way is actually frankly by leadership that is by those who are uh, responsible for running the institute to actually promote this agenda to make sure that we're having lectures, having seminars and um, dealing with the, um, with the problems, which can be quite difficult, and showing that this is a way to go. I'm hoping that if we put all these things together, that we really can tackle something new. Another very important aspect, I think, for promoting this new agenda, uh, multidisciplinarity and new ways, approaching, uh, new ways of approaching um, biological and biomedical problems, is a focus on youth, young researchers, because they are not yet hidebound in particular ways of doing things and will have a great emphasis on young group leaders, getting them in place, giving them independence early and in fact the majority of group leaders, perhaps two thirds or so, will be in that category. They'll have a career stage in the CRIC, 10-12 years, and then we will help to try and place them elsewhere in the country, even with a start-up package, to leave us and go somewhere else. So this is another way of actually trying to get these difficult ways of approaching problems going, focusing on youth who have no fear. I think that physiology is the, um, the, the central um, discipline, in a sense, of biology. Physiology focuses on function. What it uh, tries to explain is biological phenomena, in terms of uh, physics and chemistry or uh, other um, aspects of these complex systems that make up um, living organisms. But what um, it, it's uh, trying to do is to um, make sense of complex biological phenomena, um, such as how you reproduce yourselves, how, you, how we reproduce ourselves, how all living things reproduce themselves, how we remain homeostatic, 
I mean, how we regulate our, um, um, our, our cells, our tissues, our organs, how we regulate growth and development. All of these are higher level biological phenomena. It's the natural territory of physiology. And physiology has to use all the different um, tools and disciplines that are elsewhere. Molecular biology, genetics, biochemistry, systems biology, immunology. All of that is pulled together so physiology can make sense of biological phenomena. And that's how I see um, the role of physiology today and in the future. Well, thank you, Jonathan, for those kind remarks. It's indeed a pleasure, actually an honor, um, to be asked by Jonathan, as he said, um, to say a few opening remarks before the beginning of this meeting. When I asked him what he would like me to talk about, he said, well, you could discuss what physiology means to me, where I might think it uh, could go um, in the future. And that was something I was very pleased to do, because um, although I'm not um, a member of your community, I often describe myself as a, a cellular physio physiologist, somebody who is um, interested in the physiology of cells. And I think that will become um, more obvious why I say that um, a, a little later. Now, when faced with a task of talking about something like physiology, I find it quite useful to turn to see what the dictionary makers have made of uh, such terms. So I went to the Oxford um, English Dictionary and um, came... Oh, I've got to... Ah. Let's go. I can't advance the slide. Never very good with technology. <laughs> there. Good, good. Let's, thank you. Maybe I got helped by somebody. Um, we'll see. So I went to the Oxford English Dictionary, there, and that's uh, what I first discovered. The branch of science that deals with the normal functioning of living organisms and their parts. Now, that, I think, is a, a very, very useful definition. Seems to me that it encapsulates the central task of biology. That is to explain how living organisms work. How do they maintain themselves? How do they grow, develop, reproduce? All the things at a higher level of, 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 of biological operation that is central to understanding life. And it places physiology, therefore, at the center of biology. And as a cell physiologist, I felt but rather comfortable about that. But I then looked on to the second sentence in the Oxford English Dictionary, and I got shocked by the second sentence, which said, insofar as it is not dealt with by more recent sciences. Now, this seemed a bit of a put-down, to be perfectly honest. Perfect first sentence, second sentence implying um, that it somehow occupies the gaps between um, more recent sciences. It's sort of being edged out um, um, from um, the uh, central place that I obviously just argued for it. And I felt uncomfortable about that, and I think, uh, as physiologists, um, you would also feel extremely uh, um, uncomfortable about that. And I wanted to say how I take such a different view to this, because indeed there are many um, disciplines of, of biology that have come about in, in, the, in the last century, but I see these as contributing to physiology rather than substituting for physiology. And I think that is very, very crucial. Um, areas like molecular biology, genetics, biochemistry, immunology, and so on, in my view, can all be harnessed to the task of physiology, which is to understand biological function. I see these other disciplines, in, in other words, um, as adding to physiology, of making it more effective. So me, as a cellular physiologist, has always wanted to understand how cells function. In particular, how do they reproduce themselves? That's been my core interest most of my life. And I have personally used whatever is needed to achieve that objective. Sometimes I've acted as a geneticist or a molecular biologist or a biochemist, for example. But I'm always 
a physiologist, always wanting to understand how cells function, how they work, using whatever tools, whatever approaches are actually required. So physiology for me is crucial for biology. So where is it going in the future? Well, I just want to make a few remarks about that, um, which um, I think um, is how I see uh, 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 areas may, this area may develop um, in, in the future. And I turned to um, uh, Dennis Noble, N Boyd and Noble's excellent book, and I stole this um, from his um, book, The Logic of Life, and in it, well, at, towards the beginning, are the Chinese characters for physiology, um, life, logic, study. And what I see this indicates is an important direction for physiology. One, of course, it's had um, all, all the time that it's been studied. But it is a focus on logic, information, and systems that I think is really crucial um, in um, physiological studies in the coming years. And that's what I really would like to talk a little bit about um, in um, my, the rest of my introductory remarks. So information and systems and the logic behind them. Now thinking about living organisms as complex systems has been around for many, many years. In fact, you cannot be a biologist unless you think that way. Um, to my surprise, when I looked into it some years ago, I found that it had um, quite um, uh, interesting origins with the philosopher Immanuel Kant at the beginning of the 19th century who um, had quite a few pages in a book on moral philosophy of all things discussing um, the issue of, of systems and um, living organisms. But of course it's become particularly a focus in uh, recent years um, in the last century um, after the uh, prominence um, that computing and information studies um, gained um, after the Second World War. Now, many biological phenomena can be described in terms of interacting components that make up um, the complex system. That's the way that we normally think about it. And in my view, that often you can make best sense of those uh, complex interacting systems when they are considered in terms of the information flow through that system. Now, these systems operate at different levels. They operate at the level of cells, which I shall perhaps talk mostly about, neurons, for example, um, ecological processes for ecosystems. But I want to consider uh, at the lower level particularly cells, primarily because they're the basic unit of life. So I think the idea here is to explain higher order biological phenomena, phenomena such as homeostasis, communication, reproduction, spatial and temporal organization in terms of information flow, logic, and systems. An approach which emphasizes regulation, networks, organization, emergent behaviors. In short, if I can summarize this, is to translate, and I'm thinking particularly of cells here, um, but it, it also works for tissues, organs, and, and organisms often, to translate the descriptions of the chemical and physical processes going on into the underlying system and the management of information within that system, i.e. the uh, gathering of information, the storing of information and its processing, and how outputs from that is actually determined. Now, to illustrate this point, I want to actually go to two well-known examples in molecular biology to indicate that actually molecular biology, if you're going to make sense of life, is indeed built upon systems and information flow. And I'm going to start with the very familiar um, double helix of DNA. Now, the point about this is that you can describe it in terms of its structure, the double helix. You can describe it in terms of the angstroms and what atoms are touching um, other atoms, and you get a molecular picture of what it is. But for it to make sense biologically, that is, as the mo molecule of heredity, what you have to understand about this molecule is that it is essentially a digital information storage device. That's what makes biological sense. The sequence of nucleotides there, as we all know, encodes information. It's digitally encoded. 
It in turn determines um, uh, uh, RNA and then protein structure, the basis of life's chemical machines. But it's only when the chemical structure of DNA is expressed in terms of information storage does it make biological sense in the sense of understanding what the nature of heredity is. So this is just one simple example of how a focus on the information makes um, biological sense. A second one, also um, from um, molecular biology, is to do with metabolic regulation and its control. Now this is obviously um, not from a living object. This is a governor from a steam engine um, which I discovered in New Zealand um, in an engine um, built in 1896, driving a boat going across a lake. Now, I don't know if you're like me, but essentially um, I sort of understand how all machines work before about 1900, but um, virtually no machines designed or built after 1900. I'm not quite sure what happened there, though I'll comment on it a bit later. But I tend to go back to the um, 19th century. This is an example of a negative feedback. Um, what we see here is a governor, and we have a spindle, and as the engine is rotating, those balls are thrown out by centrifugal force. They lift a valve up, that brass collar, and that cuts off the steam that goes to the engine. That, in turn, reduces the uh, speed of the spindle, the balls come back in again, and that lets steam go back into the engine. This is a negative feedback loop that maintains homeostasis. Jacob and Mono use this in their uh, analysis of the lac operon, and that is seen in the top um, uh, part of this diagram here of a negative feedback loop. Here we have, in a metabolic pathway, we have um, a, a component turning from A to B to C. Um, the notion here is that the accumulation of C inhibits the uh, catalysis um, from A to B. And so as C builds up, you switch off the A to B transition, shutting off the production of C. That produces a negative feedback loop. This is what was used to describe the functioning of the lac operon. Beneath that is a positive feedback loop which turns itself into a switch where the buildup of C, instead of inhibiting A to B, promotes the uh, transition from A to B. So once you start this pathway, you turn the whole thing into a, into a switch. These are examples, two very simple examples, of regulatory circuits that you find all over the place in living organisms at all sorts of levels. And these circuits form um, interesting regulatory feedback controls switches, timers, oscillators, toggles, which when combined together form complex networks. And it's those complex networks that uh, allow us to begin to understand biological function. What we need to do is to translate the chemistry of the networks into these modules that are processing the information. Once again, you could have described the lac operon, for example, in terms of um, small molecular weight metabolites interacting with proteins, with nucleic acids, but you wouldn't understand what is going on biologically until that is translated into the management of information in the way I've just described. And we can think of these in terms of, of met metaphors, um, some wit. Um, uh, I think the, I, I, I got this from Embo Journal of, of a decade or more ago, um, has taken a, a, a transistor radio and labeled various components in the network there with different um, oncogenes to illustrate um, the importance of the connections between these components and the regulatory um, circuits that they actually represent. Now, we shouldn't get too seduced by these sorts of metaphors. As Dennis Bray has emphasized, what we're looking at in terms of living cells is not hardware, which are hard uh, wired together, but wetware, where you can connect um, different elements within the living system with diffusing um, molecules, allowing you the potential to rewire the uh, network um, by changing what the molecules might connect to. And that gives a very powerful um, increase in the ability to manage information and to produce a uh, complex system that is flexible enough to deal with it. So we need to consider the cell and living organisms as complex chemical systems which act as logical computational machines 
of linked logical um, modules. To go back to um, Dennis's, Dennis Noble this time, uh, a, a, a figure in the, uh, in the start of his book. Now, how might this work in the future? And I just want to give you a few examples of how these thinking, none of these examples are, are, are ones I've thought of, um, of, of, of what I think is interesting in taking this type of approach um, to um, issues. The first is that um, to understand that often these networks are connected together in, um, in, in, in systems, in networks, and that understanding how networks uh, operate um, is uh, in other types of systems can be very illuminating to um, biology, to cells and organisms. I'm thinking of the networks that are studied in ecology, or in sociology, or even as in this case, for example, in um, um, air airplane um, networks. Here, as you can see, and it's an example of, of, air, of networks connecting hubs um, of, uh, in different parts of the United States. And what you can um, conclude from this is um, for this particular set of, of, of routing, um, somewhere, probably Houston, um, down in the bottom right, is extremely important for the operation of the soul of this network. If you take out Houston, the whole system collapses. Somewhere in the middle there, you'll see Kansas City, which in contrast, if you take out Kansas City, nothing very much happens. And um, you, you, you might say, well, we're not surprised, but I mean, um, that's something else. Um, and the point I'm trying to make is understanding how complex networks work can be uh, very, very helpful at all sorts of different levels. And you'll, it, this is a, 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 an approach that a multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary sort of approach that, um, that um, we need to do as biological scientists, as physiologists. Um, looking at networks, um, above here you'll see the linear pathway, which is the way... Um, in which uh, human minds feel most comfortable with. I'll come back to that in a, in, a, in a moment. And it's how we tend, when we're faced with a problem, to try and explain what is going on. That is, that there's some linear pathway of causal connections that bring about a consequence such that it's rather simple to see what's happening. So if we look at the green arrows up there, then if you activate the arrow at the beginning, then the uh, consequence of that is obvious, that you will activate the arrow at the end, um, given time. The reality is, of course, that networks are rather more complex in living um, systems, and uh, what I've described at the bottom there, a complex network, is much less intuitive in trying to work out what may happen. We have a parallel pathways, we have negative feedback, we have positive feedback. And so if you interfere with an arrow somewhere on the left-hand side of that figure, it can be intuitively rather difficult to work out what the uh, consequence of that um, might be. And you need to uh, need uh, special methodologies to be able to deal with it. The reason I'm mentioning it is that living systems are much more likely to be made up of complex networks than the uh, simple networks. Now, there's another thought I want to make about this, is, um, which is, how do you think about these problems? And I'm going to show you a slide which I was, uh, I'm always uh, too nervous to show in the United States. This is a slide I took from a... I'm a pilot, and I took it from a pilot's manual, um, and the, uh, the message is very clear. Men are very simple-minded. They're either on or they're off. Women, on the other hand, have more subtle minds and uh, take on board the complexity of the, the, of the problems that I was describing on the previous slide. And essentially why I put this up is that we have to think much more in a feminine way, that is, taking on the complexity of life, than this rather simple-minded view that men often have. The reason I'm nervous at saying it, that after I tried this once or twice, I'd be harangued after the lecture by various people um, saying why was I so sexist in my remarks at this slide. And um, so that's why I'm a little nervous now. Now, one other comment about pathways. Um, if you look at the green arrows down at the bottom, then uh, it's clear what would happen. If you switch on the left-hand arrow, you will switch on the right-hand arrow. So it's a, it's a very simple um, information communication device. But you can use such a network, a very simple one, in more complex ways. You can use it dynamically. 
And um, you'll see above there, I've tried to illustrate that. If you pulse information down that network, then you can convey more information with the same components. If, for example, um, a pulse of, uh, of, uh, of signal four times in unit time means something to a pulse of um, two pulses in unit time, then you can use the same network to convey different sorts of information. Now, that's becoming increasingly clear that that's important. And um, the significance of this, I suspect we've underestimated, and I want to use another metaphor to illustrate um, uh, uh, the importance of this. If you take that simple network, you have something close to a traffic light system. You're either green or you're red. If, on the other hand, you introduce dynamics, and the dynamics of signaling down a single telegraph wire involving, in this case, the Morse code with different pulsing of information, what you now do is turn a, uh, a, a device that can either say yes or no into one in principle that can write the works of Shakespeare or at least communicate the works of Shakespeare. And the point I only want to make is if you introduce dynamics into these systems, then you can make, uh, communicate much more information. And I think increasingly, as we understand that, it will become important. A final, or not quite final, point I want to make is the importance of establishing spatial and temporal order within living things. It's a basis of what they are, after all, and the basis to what I was interested in, particularly the, the soul cycle. And for that, um, if I look at spatial order... You can start with very simple systems that, frankly, are not very interesting. This is a phage head. It has morphology, but it's morphology which is determined simply by um, a, a atomic um, linkages and is, is nothing very special. But in biology, we have spatial order that extends beyond atomic interaction. We have spatial order that is generated on a wider domain and is based upon um, the structure of, um, of chemical interactions of molecules, um, which allow that order to be extended beyond the level of the uh, of a few angstroms. And um, uh, Alan Turing, who's, be, who's being talked a lot about at the moment in, in, in the UK, um, amongst his other many uh, things that he achieved, um, was to, uh, 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 to um, uh, produce um, equations um, that um, described um, uh, uh, reaction diffusion the, cell, uh, the basis of the belosov sabatinsky reaction, for example, which allowed from simple chemistry to generate structure on a much bigger order. Now, these things are complicated. The, this, for example, doesn't easily regulate to um, different sizes of domains, which you have to do. But the principle is clear, that we have to understand how information flow can generate spatial and temporal order beyond local interactions. One other thing I would like to say um, about um, thinking about these complex systems and information flow um, is uh, really to do with evolution. And uh, my metaphor here is John Harrison's clocks. John Harrison um, was a clockmaker in um, England in the 18th century, and he was competing for um, a prize from the British Admiralty to create a clock accurate enough um, to determine um, longitude, which you require a very accurate clock that can work at, at sea. He designed H1, the first uh, clock up there in the top left. It worked pretty well, but not quite accurately enough for those mean people in the Admiralty to give him the prize. And he learned his lessons from that clock and designed um, from first principles a second clock, H2, on the top right, and then a third one, H3, bottom left, and fourthly, um, H4 on the bottom right, which won, um, well, part of the Admiralty Prize, because they were still mean even 25 or 30 years later. The point I want to make here is that all of these were intelligently designed. That is to say, you started with one clock, you learnt your lessons, then you went back to the drawing board and, and, and made another clock. Living systems are not like that. Living systems evolve, and what that means is that, A, we have the remnants of the controls that were operative 
um, and the way that the system operated um, in, the, uh, in, the pre in previous organisms, in the progenitors, and um, these would still be there. And secondly, you would always have to evolve from um, one historical state into the state you are now. So where you go is determined by um, where you were before. This leads to greater complexity in what you're trying to understand. And sometimes we get seduced in, particularly when we look upon these problems as, as physicists often do, is to look for the simplest possible explanation of a phenomenon does not reflect adequately where our uh, mechanisms come from, which is evolution by natural selection. They are often inefficient, the phenomena we're looking at. They often involve parallel systems. They often involve redundant systems, and we're all familiar with that. And we can't just simply assume that the simplest explanation will be the, um, the adequate one. So what's the principle of really what I've been saying today, just to put this last slide up again? Well, it is to turn the descriptions of physica, physics and chemistry into um, understanding of complex systems and information management. And I think this will be, and already is, of course, a key aspect of physiology. But I wanted to end with saying one or two other things, because um, one thing that's really, really clear to all of us in this audience is the complexity of living organisms. And this complexity may lead to counterintuitive explanations. Biological explanations are still mostly in a common sense world. When we do experiments, we imagine um, our, uh, uh, explaining them in terms of our everyday experiences of the everyday world. But it's possible that complexity may take biological explanation into a stranger world. In this way, it may be a little like physics. In physics, when you are dealing with the very big and the very small, they become increasingly bizarre. It is possible, I think, in biology, and particularly taking a physiological approach, that the complexity which will underpin that may also lead us away from our common sense familiar world. Think about physics before 1900. It was mostly very common sense, just like Newton's laws of physics, which you could, you could understand um, intuitively. Then came Einstein in 1905 with relativity. And that's tricky. You know when you read these um, books of, uh, uh, explaining relativity to the layman? You open them, you read them, you get it, you close the book, and then it slowly drifts away. Because somehow it doesn't actually get into your intuition. It's sort of outside our common sense world. And if you think that you have trouble there, shift on another 20 years into quantum mechanics and you are truly in an Alice and Wonderland world. There you have to imagine cats which are both alive and dead at the same time. It really, with Schrodinger's cat, for example. This is impossible to comprehend um, except within the mathematics. It's be the complexity and the remoteness makes it difficult for us to understand. This became um, clear to me um, with my daughter. My daughter works at CERN. Um, she's a high-energy physicist in the Higgs boson area. And I got a sense into this when I realized she didn't understand it either. This, she's very good. She's very professional. It makes sense in terms of the mathematics but it doesn't make sense in our intuition and our common sense world. So what I'm thinking of here is that it is possible that the complexity in biology may move us into a strange world where we will require the assistance of the, of the physicists, particularly in the mathematicians, to deal with the abstractions and to deal with the other worldliness that it may take us. So I finish by saying... I have a great optimism for the future of physiology. I think it is essentially biology. I think we need to increasingly utilize some of the thinking of system biologists. We will need the help of our um, uh, other scientific colleagues to take multidisciplinary approaches. And we absolutely, in my view, need to focus on the management of information if we are to explain biological phenomena. So those are my remarks at the beginning of this meeting 
And I want to finish by just saying I hope you have a great time here in Birmingham and a great meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you.